Um, if you could please state your full names uh, for the record and then take the oath or the affirmation uh, as you wish. I'm Dominic Moxon Tretch. I'm the Director of Regulation and Public Policy for Taxify. Uh, if you could please, Mr. Tretch, just uh, for purposes of the transcript, just spell your surname M O X O N hyphen T R I T S C H. Uh, thank you. My name is Gareth Taylor, and I'm the country manager for Taxify. I, Dominic Moxon Tritch, solemnly affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I, Gareth Taylor, swear that the evidence that I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Uh, thank you. If you could please start just by uh, introductions in terms of the position that you currently occupy uh, within Taxify and how long have you occupied uh, those positions? Uh, Thank you very much, stretch. Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Um, I've been with Taxify since October last year. Uh, prior to that, I was head of public policy for Uber for Europe, Middle East and Africa throughout 2014. After that, I moved to Europe's largest private hire car service called Addison Lee. And in this capacity, I've advised the European Commission, the governments of the UK, France and Germany on regulation in this sector. I've been country manager since February this year. Before that, I was the chief operating officer of the Awetu project, a micro business incubator that specializes in providing business opportunities for individuals in South Africa. Uh, thank you. I understand that you have prepared a presentation. I think you can go ahead uh, with, with Mr. Your Chairman, thank you very much indeed. Um, with your permission, we'd like to take a slightly different approach to the presentation you've had immediately preceding. Uh, you've had nearly 100 pages of written submissions from us in three installments. We don't propose to go back over what's in those uh, pages, unless there's any points in there that you'd specifically like to address. We also don't have death by PowerPoint either, I'm pleased to say. My colleague here, as the MD for Taxify in South Africa, will give a very short oral presentation, and then we propose that this session be more discursive, shall we say, more back and forth. We take the view that we're here to answer the Commission's questions, so we put ourselves at your disposal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so just as some context and background to Taxify, uh, it started in 2013, and uh, it was started by one of the founders, Marcos Willig, who started with the uh, intention of being able to enable metered taxi cabs to become more efficient, more effective, and to be able to increase their earnings. In uh, 2015, it started here in South Africa with a similar mission where we engaged with metered cabs in order to enable them to uh, compete in the 21st century and try to entice them to join as a fleet on the on the platform. However, the growth that we experienced uh, experienced an upsurge from 2016 when we moved to the private driver model. I'll now move on to, as, as my colleague alluded to, we're going to be focusing more on the, the Competition Act itself and the, the purpose of it. And our presentation will be focused on how that impacts uh, our operations. So from the Act, the competition, is, uh, competition Act is there to promote and maintain competition, obviously. And this is uh, done to, well, I'm going to speak on each one of these points. And then I'm going to speak about how Taxify, as a business, enables each of these uh, and, and, and ensures each of these for South African citizens as a whole. So the first is that it promotes efficiency, adaptability, and development of the economy. The second is that it promotes employment and advances social and economic welfare. The third is that it is to promote a greater spread of ownership, specifically ownership amongst historically in disadvantaged individuals. This is also the purpose to provide consumers with competitive prices and product choices. 
and to ensure that small and medium inter enterprises have equitable opportunity to participate in the economy. Obviously, for yourselves as being the commissioner and chair and the, the evidence leaders, you, you know this. This is more for the, uh, the rest of us who are here and also just to provide context. With regards to efficiency, as alluded to in the previous presentation, by enabling taxify with drivers who are operating and using the Taxify platform, they're able to operate throughout the region. And this enables higher rates of utilization, which then results in better prices, more competitive prices for the consumers. One of the contentions about route allocation is demand and supply, as has been discussed. So if we were to allocate routes, um, for example, in the mornings, if people living in Soweto want to be able to commute to the CBD, whether that's Santon CBD or Johannesburg CBD, there would be a large amount of demand in Soweto, for example, in the morning. If drivers were to be constrained to operate only within Soweto, this would mean that they would have one trip in the morning, then be constrained to come back after that trip, by which time peak would have ended and their vehicle would lie largely unutilized for the rest of the day. In the same way, those drivers who were to operate in the CBD would experience higher demand in the afternoon, traveling, taking their passengers back home. However, would experience high rates of underutilization or unutilization for the rest of the day. This lower, these lower rates of utilization result in higher prices for the consumers, which ultimately does not fulfill the ambit of the Competition Act, which is what we are trying to achieve here at the end of the day. Adaptability, one of the items you spoke there is that it's to, also to promote adaptability. Within the driver app for Taxify, the drivers are able to see where there is higher demand. And where the higher demand is, the drivers then know that they can go to those areas in order to satisfy that demand, therefore enabling supply to be more adaptable, thus once more fulfilling the ambit of the Competition Act. It is also to develop the economy. Now, there are second and third tier results to the Taxify business. Not only do drivers who are operating and using the Taxify platform to be linked to riders running their own business, often those drivers rent those vehicles from vehicle owners, which then means that there are transport service providers who are the drivers. In addition to that, there is another business, which is those vehicle owners who then rent those vehicles to drivers. The second tier is then, well, the vehicles need to be purchased from somewhere. So there is further development with the purchase of those vehicles and the insurance of those vehicles and the fuel required for those vehicles and the airtime that those drivers need in order to operate. All of these stimulating and developing the economy. The second point is to promote employment and advance social and economic welfare. These drivers who are operating as service transport service providers are able to run their businesses and carry fair pay paying passages throughout the country. As a result, each one of these individuals are able to employ themselves in addition to the downstream effects of the development of this economy. This results in a better livelihood for themselves and for their families. However, there is also the advancement of social welfare for individuals who otherwise would not be able to ac gain access to such efficient, affordable, and reliable transport. In South Africa, there are prohibitive barriers to entry for vehicle ownership, whether that is a lack of capital or a poor credit record as a result of mistakes in the past. Essentially, individuals who want to be able to experience the benefits of car ownership are unable to do so because they don't have that capital up front or to have a poor credit record. What Taxify essentially enables is these individuals to have access to the benefits of private transport without those prohibitive expenses up front. 
This results in individuals being able to gain safe transport to wherever they may want to go because they can be picked up outside their door and dropped off wherever they want to go. Where the alternatives often are public transport, which do not operate past a certain time, or they drop them off in a certain location which requires them to walk by themselves often at times and in areas that are often insecure. Once more, resulting in social welfare or social benefits. The third one is to enhance and enable or to promote a greater spread of ownership, specific, specifically amongst historically disadvantaged individuals. It is no secret that the majority of drivers who operate using the Taxify platform, that the majority of them are black and historically disadvantaged as a result, per the definition. Each one of these transport service providers who, operate, who are private drivers who are operators essentially runs a transportation service provision business. Therefore, enabling them to own a business, which is an asset, which is what this aims to achieve. In addition, is obviously the owners of those vehicles as well, the majority of whom are also historically disadvantaged individuals as per this definition. At this point, I would also like to point out that the earnings of the drivers who utilize the Taxify platform is three times the hourly minimum, min national minimum wage. So when there is a contention that these drivers are not able to earn a living, when we have a look at the evidence and the facts, they speak for themselves. The fourth is that the act should provide consumers with competitive prices and product choice. Now, with Taxify coming into the market, there are now two main players within the e-hailing space, which means that from a competition perspective, consumers and drivers benefit because consumers benefit from the better prices and drivers will not be taken advantage of because there are at least two players in the market. Therefore, resulting in competitive prices for consumers and better rates for the drivers. What's more, by enabling e-hailing to operate and compete in the market, there is additional product choice for consumers as well. The last point is that it is to ensure small and medium enterprises have an equitable opportunity to participate in the economy. As mentioned previously, both transport service providers, who are the operators, as well as the owners of the vehicles, are SMEs. And as a result, employment for the thousands of these operators who utilize our platform is created for the most part through SMEs. Mr. Chair, that concludes our presentation holding to the specifics of the Competition Act. <coughs> I'm not certain if you would like us to answer some of the questions that were posed to the previous presenters, so that we can maybe do that a little more concisely. I think by all means, I think feel free to, to do that. Mr. Chair, one of the questions posed was, have drivers complete, complied with operating licenses? In our experience, operating licenses are there to achieve three main things. So if we go back to the purpose, that is to ensure there is not an oversupply, to ensure that there is sufficient quality of drivers, and to ensure that there is safety of the consumers using that service. Each of these is addressed 
by drivers and vehicles that are allowed to operate on the Taxify, using the Taxify platform. With regards to safety, every driver who, before he is allowed onto the platform, needs to obtain a PRDP, and through that, that PRDP allows them to be able to carry fair paying passages. In order to achieve that and obtain that PRDP, they also need to go through a criminal background check. In addition to that criminal background check, which is done for that PRDP, Taxify runs an additional criminal background check to ensure that none of those drivers have a criminal record and are not allowed to operate on the platform should they be found to do, be so. In addition, there are other safety measures, such as ratings, where drivers are able to rate riders and riders are able to rate drivers. As a result, drivers are able to see the ratings of riders or fare paying passengers before they pick them up and are also able to, and are therefore able to see through that rating if there are any issues with that individual. In addition, every rider who comes onto the platform needs to verify their cell phone number and thereby we are relying on the RECA process which, result, which requires individuals to provide their proof of identity as well as proof of their residential. With regards to quality, the vehicles require an operating card, or operator card, or double disc. And in order to achieve that, that needs to go through a roadworthy, where the vehicles have to go through a roadworthy inspection. In addition to this roadworthy inspection, Taxify requires these vehicles to go through a DECRA inspection. Once more, another layer of quality that we require. What's more, the rating system between drivers and riders ensures that <coughs> we can maintain a live, updated view of how well drivers are performing. And those drivers who receive lower ratings are blocked from using the platform. The third one is that of supply. Last week in our meeting with the Gauteng Provincial Legislature, we had this discussion with them as well. And the discussion there was, how does one define oversupply? And in order to determine oversupply, we need to have a look at demand. Now, as I mentioned er earlier, many individuals are utilizing the Taxify service because they're able to enjoy the benefits of private vehicle ownership without actually owning the vehicle. What we are finding then is that there is a trend where individuals are choosing not to buy a second vehicle or not to buy a vehicle at all, but rather to use a Taxify service. Now, if 5% of the vehicle owners in South Africa were to choose to use e-hailing instead of owning their own vehicles, would there then be an oversupply? Our contention would be that wouldn't be the case because it is relative to demand. Operating licenses are there to control demand, uh, supply when the demand is localized to a specific region. So if, for example, there is a specific rank or a highly defined area as defined earlier where it's just this part of Soweto, operating licenses become relevant and important to regulate the supply in that specific area. Our contention is that market forces regulate supply and demand in a far better fashion than regulation does. It is more efficient and more effective because those providers, those operators who perhaps are part-time operators and have a full-time job elsewhere, if they are not earning sufficient income during, whilst operating there, may seek other forms of employment. Those individuals who are full-time business owners and drivers on the platform, should that they not earn sufficient income because there is an oversupply, would rather seek alternative forms of business. Therefore, the market regulates whether there is an over or undersupply. In these instances, because e-hailing offers individuals to enjoy the same benefits as private vehicle ownership, we would contend that by localizing such a service prevents it from being as great as it otherwise would be. 
we've spoken about surge pricing. Surge pricing is as a result of undersupply. During those specific times, there is an undersupply. How then can we have a contention that there is oversaturation in the market if surge pricing is evidence of undersupply in those specific times in those specific areas? Mr. Taylor, is, um, is that demand, that the demand that arises from or which such pricing seeks to re respond to, uh, is that not, uh, you know, transient uh, or temporal demand um, which arises? Um, may be created, for example, by a specific event um, um, such that your, that proposition then becomes too strongly stated. I'll assist my colleague there, if I may. I think you're right. There's certainly a temporal component to it, and you see this in respect of events on a one-off basis, for example, the football match that's been referred to earlier. I think you're right, but I don't think that's necessarily definitional. The reality is that you also see structural components to it as well. And from the graphs presented to you earlier, certainly our demand profile looks very similar. But I would contend that rather than being the temporal aspect that's engaged here, I'd suggest that actually the, the relevant aspect is the geographic component. So looking to the MREs, who assess demand on a you know, municipal basis, particularly in the context of metered taxis, and control supply to ensure that there's a sustainable level of work for the number of metered taxi licenses in issue. That's absolutely right, and for that segment of the market, that's right and proper. But it becomes a question of market definition, because metered taxis enjoy particular privileges, particularly street hail and working from ranks, that ride-hailing companies don't have and you know, rightly don't avail ourselves of because we would say that we're addressing to access ground transport on the basis of walking up to a taxi rank is participating in a different market to somebody using an e-hailing app. So this, I'd suggest, is it becomes around geographical and it becomes a market definition issue rather than a temporal one. I hope that's of assistance. Um, a follow-up question is um, whether you are able to give us a proportion of these um, uh, rights that would be subjected to such pricing like um, Uber did earlier. I don't think we have an average number of rides number to hand. We can certainly provide that subsequently in correspondence. What I can offer, though, is... Obviously, surge pricing has the potential to create an unfairness for a consumer. So again, in the event of you know, the football match that's been discussed earlier, in the event that there hasn't been a sensible management of how surge pricing works, you can end up with runaway surge pricing. So you could end up with a consumer being confronted with, oh my gosh, 10 times the normal price I'd expect to pay. Or worse, somebody paying 10 times not realizing that that payment was going to be charged up front. So one of the things that you know, we are um, very proud to do is that surge pricing is capped at 2.3 times the usual fare throughout South Africa. So I think you're absolutely right. I think, there's, I think there's, a, there's a fairness question here. For us, this is self-regulating. This is a market finding equilibrium. And you know, we'd suggest if you get burned by an ex excessive surge charge multiple times on one platform, the chances are you're going to find another platform that doesn't do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Moving on to one of the uh, other questions was, uh, metered cabs need to comply with having meters in their vehicles. And this adds additional costs with regards to the cost of the meter, with regards to uh, sealing the meter, etc. Once more, I'd like us to go back to the purpose of the meter. So it is to ensure that the consumer is protected. 
and to ensure that the rates are transparent. Before riders take a trip using Taxify, they are able to see the range of what the trip will cost them. And they also are able to see what those rates are. And so the app itself fulfills the purpose and requirements to do so. In the act, in the Competition Act, it speaks about competition being protected and not competitors necessarily being comp co protected. I'll come in on the taxi meter point, if I may, because obviously taxi meter is a term of art and one defined in law. Um, I'm not aware of a South African authority uh, where the definition of taxi meter is challenged. Colloquially, it's understood to be a device that measures both time and distance. In 2016, the High Court in London litigated this point in excruciating detail, I think it's fair to say, under a reference by Transport for London about what is a taxi meter. If it would be of assistance to the Commission, I'd be happy to provide the text of that judgment to assist with your we'll, deliberations. We'll, we'll certainly appreciate it. Happy to, happy to provide that. Mr. Chair, one of the questions was how should PRE know whether to grant e-hailers licenses? As, as discussed previously, market forces within the e-hailing industry play a significant role in ensuring the matching of supply and demand. We've heard about uh, a square peg being hammered into a round hole. In this instance, we would contend, as, as, as my colleague Darwin referred to previously, that there are two separate markets here. There is a market for metered cabs, and there is a market for e-hailing. And so within the e-hailing, with the market uh, matching supply and demand, we would contend that should drivers who are operating using an e-hailing platform wish to do so, that they be granted e-hailing licenses specifically. And best practice in the industry is that those licenses are granted within five to 10 days. So I, our, our ideal ask would be that e-hailing licenses could be provided in a shorter period of time as that. And uh, my colleague will be able to give some more information on best practice in terms of uh, internationally and worldwide that could be of assistance to the Commission. I think the, on the narrow competition law point about market definition, I'd put it to the Commissioners that there is, a, there is not complete substitutability between the metered taxi market and the e-hailing market because of the special privileges enjoyed by meter taxi, rightly so, as a result of their status in regulation, namely being able to do street hail and being able to do ranking work. Ergo, somebody that wants to access ground transport via one of these means is unable to use a pure e-hailing platform. Now, this analysis is slightly muddied by the fact that there are some e-hailing platforms that meter taxis use. I understand Cruise is a big one in South Africa. I think Zebra also has e-hailing capability. So there's a degree of substitutability that the meter taxis enjoy into, shall we say, our segment of the market. But we would contend that we don't substitute into their segment of the market because it's a completely different use case and a completely different need that the meter taxis are addressing. I'd like to just follow up on that specific point because the presentation we, we, we had earlier from Uber was suggesting that um, in fact it's for the meter taxis to catch up with the where the e-hailing uh, services are. Uh, and the, if you speak to meter taxis, they will tell you that there's specifically, there's a specific regulatory framework that everybody in the industry has to comply with. Whereas your suggestion is that actually where the industry is needs to catch up with where the demand is for the specific services that are provided by e-hailing services. So just please clarify uh, uh, your point in, re in regard to that. Absolutely. And, it, and, and it, 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 get it gets to the nub of the question here. Look, the reality is that as a business, I mean, we, we strain every sinew to comply with every aspect of South African regulation, you know, both at municipal, provincial and at national level as well. 
The reality is that there has been what has been described today as a logjam in the issuance of operating licenses, primarily at municipal level. But I would suggest that there is an additional regulatory bar for meter taxis to get over to enjoy the special privileges that they enjoy. Now, these are not privileges which we seek to enjoy. We, we seek to allow them exclusive franchise in the area of choice, namely, you know, ranking, street hailing, and, you know, if they're going to come and compete on our territory and do e-hailing work, then so much the better. We welcome lively competition. And as my colleague Gareth has mentioned, when Taxify first came to South Africa, the intention was to offer the technology platform to metered taxis, who at that time felt that the special privileges that they enjoyed meant that they didn't need to access digital platforms in order to be able to be assured of a steady stream of work. The reality is, and you know, this is perhaps a stronger word than I might have chosen in this setting, but we are on record in our written submissions as having described the meter taxi's way of working, namely via ranks and via street hailing, as archaic because it is a very old-fashioned model which hasn't really changed in decades. In London, the regulatory framework dates back to the late 19th century. So, I mean, the reality is that the taxi industry has a, a, long, in, a long history, but has been resistant to change in order to defend, shall we say, the, what we would contend are the excess profits which they, engage, which they enjoy as a result of artificially constrained supply of licenses into that segment. Now, what has happened is consumer preference has changed. So to, the, so to the nub of your question, the reality is that people no longer want to have to walk to a rank or rely upon a, an empty taxi driving past when they need to access flexible ground transport. People are now accustomed to you know, using their mobile phone as a remote control for their life and summoning a vehicle to where they are to take them to where they go with all of the safety features that my colleague has described. I think there's always going to be a, a role for licensed, for metered taxis in any flexible ground transport ecosystem, particularly clustering as it does now round transport hubs, such as Gauteng Railway Station or the airport, for example. But the reality is that the price point that the metered taxis are at is one that consumers are, are increasingly resistant to pay, particularly given all of the inconveniences that go with that historical model. So at the risk of agreeing with your question, I think, I think change is sweeping through that segment of the market driven by pressure from an adjacent market segment, namely e-hailing. When you first came to South Africa, you offered um, a, a meter taxi some form of co uh, partnership Right. 